Hey guys, so this is a continuance of my lower respiratory long lecture or longer lecture, even though I'm breaking it up into smaller pieces. Um, and this part is all about asthma. So let's jump right in. So asthma, um, we talked a little bit about how asthma is a type of hypersensitivity disorder. It's an uh, overreaction, just like when we talked about things like anaphylaxis, allergic rhinitis, et cetera. Um, but the body's overreacting to an allergen and it's leading to a progressive squeezing constriction of the airways. Um, and um, it leads to excess mucus production, which creates effectively an obstruction. So effectively think like if the airway is a tube, like a hose, that the um, the outer you know um, layer of that hose or that tube starts to become constricted and squeezed, um, you know, as a result of responding to this allergen. And then also inside these clogs start forming. So there's an outside squeezing and an inside clogging or um, obstruction or blockage that's happening because of all the excess mucus. And as strange as this sounds, um, you know, as much as it seems like it would be really hard to get oxygen in, it's actually harder to get carbon dioxide out. And a lot of this comes back to the fact that, you know, air um, breathing is, uh, it's a different process than what most people think. Like if I take a deep breath in now, um, it seems so much easier to exhale than it does to inhale, but the atmosphere actually helps me a lot with this. The atmosphere forces air into me um, naturally, um, so even if I don't want it. <laughs> so um, whereas the exhalation is actually a very active process where it seems like it's a very passive process, um, but especially if my airway becomes narrow and becomes obstructed by a bunch of mucus, what can happen is, is that there's all this mucus um, and it creates effectively turbulence for carbon dioxide to escape. Now, these people are not CO2 retainers like um, in COPD, and we'll talk about that when I get to my COPD lecture. Um, this is mainly an oxygenation problem, but it's not actually, they don't actually have trouble taking breaths in. They have a lot of trouble exhaling. So this patient's going to look a lot like a COPD patient in many ways where, um, for example, purse-lip breathing or prolonged exhalation is going to actually help them because um, it's just really over overcoming that resistance in the airway from that um, obstruction there from the mucus. Um, so asthma, um, it, it can get better. And, you know, some people, and I've heard this from physicians that, um, you know, asthma can be outgrown. Um, you know, maybe it's something that the body adjusts to or gets better, um, but it is considered a chronic condition. And per your most recent textbook, um, they say for men, it's more common in younger age. And for women, it's getting more serious, especially in an older age. And when I say older, I mean like um, they're not kids anymore. So I think your book says something like 20 to 50, or maybe it's 30 to 50. I can't remember. Um, but it's somewhere like where um, people are a little bit more into their um, young adults or older adult, depending on, please still call me a young adult. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. I'm not one of those people who's sensitive about age. I am perfectly fine with it, but um, you get the point. Is this that, um, you know, people, uh, it, women are getting it at different ages than men are, and we're seeing a higher prevalence of um, women um, that are not children um, getting it at a, I would say, maybe uh, early to middle age, just to not offend anyone else who may be sensitive about age. Um, so um, it also is known to have a genetic component. So it's something else to consider when it comes to risk factors. So what triggers asthma? So this is similar to all the other allergic rhinitis and other things that we talked about. Um, so, you know, there can be things like animal fur, mites, mold, pollen, um, cigarette smoke, perfumes, um, but then also infection can make, uh, can trigger it, chemicals can make it worse. There's even medications like beta blockers and insects um, can trigger it. Um, exercise can uh, definitely affect um, or uh, get asthma um, uh, worse. And then um, a couple other things that can worsen asthma is stress. So being in nursing school is definitely a huge stress stress that could make if you had asthma worse. And then GERD as well. And GERD is reflux. So this is um, where people have, um, you know, the um, gastric contents backing up from their esophagus. And, you know, it does make asthma worse because it definitely can slip into the airway and cause irritation. So it's almost like a chemical irritation to the lungs. So how do we diagnose asthma? Now, for both asthma and COPD, there's not like a, a we go and I'm going in for asthma testing today, but we, we look at a few things. We mostly look at symptoms, um, but we can look at what's called peak flow, and that's going to be your airway resistance when you exhale. 
Um, so um, effectively what you do, this is a peak flow meter. Um, and this is something that you uh, effectively, what you do is you take a deep breath in and you do a quick like blow out and see, um, you know, it, it measures how much resistance for that air to be exhaled. And everyone has like a different number. So it's not that they're like, you know, we do look at this and there are, you know, what is good. Um, but um, we also have to look at each individual person because um, we we later will talk about how we use this to measure what's called a personal best or see like um, uh, when things are good, how much airway resistance do you have? And that way we can use that as a measure to know when things for this patient are getting bad. Um, but uh, there's also what's called spirometry, which is like pulmonary function tests. And we talk about this more with COPD because COPD affects more um, in the like the lower lung area and can affect um, a lot more of those pulmonary function values. But for people with uh, we call it with asthma, it's more episodic or it comes and goes. And um, uh, whereas like a person with COPD is always sick um, or always has COPD, it's chronic and progressive. Um, you know, with asthma, like when they're sick, they're sick. But um, otherwise, there's many times that they're when they're not being triggered by stuff, or if they're keeping up with their meds and maintaining things well, um, they can live a pretty normal life. Um, so, uh, you know, as a whole, what we have to look at here is, is it's really hard to like tell that something's off with someone's lung and lungs and diagnose something if for most, uh, sometimes they can actually be normal and have normal, um, um, you know, lung function. So it's not that there's something crazy wrong with the lungs uh, structure and function itself. It's pretty much like if I get triggered, things go bad. But if these people are not triggered, then they can, you know, go about life and um, things can, um, you know, be pretty normal for them as long as they're maintaining things and avoiding those triggers, which we'll talk about. Um, we can also look for uh, signs of an overreaction of the immune system in the bloodstream. We can um, look for particles in the bloodstream, uh, bloodstream like things like eosinophils uh, may be present, which shows that, hey, there, my body is reacting to a um, uh, some sort of uh, like they're having an allergic like reaction. So what do we expect for an asthma patient? Um, the hallmark symptoms for an asthma patient, I always think of like how you guys are right before a nursing school exam. Um, so very anxious, your chest may feel tight. I hope you're not wheezing, but you know, like you might be breathing a little heavy, have some difficulty breathing, breathing fast. Um, you might have a cough, um, what do you call it, just coughing out that anxiety. So I just kind of imagine a very anxious, restless person. And as someone who has had an asthma attack before, it's very uncomfortable, um, you know, and um, it, it does not, uh, it's it's very um, anxiety producing where you're just like, oh, please let me breathe. Jesus, <laughs> you know, it's hard. Um, so, uh, you know, here I also am asking what acid base imbalance would you expect as a result of the tachypnea? Um, so I'll have my new acid base um, balance presentation up soon. Um, but what you would expect for someone uh, with uh, we call asthma, if they're breathing fast, you want to think anytime you're thinking about acid base, it's going to be a respiratory problem if it's a respiratory disorder. Um, but if they're breathing super fast, <sighs> We have to think about what's going on with my CO2. If I'm breathing fast, am I getting rid of acid or am I holding on to acid? Well, I'm breathing fast, I am exhaling more acid. So I'm gonna be losing acid. So I'm gonna be in a state of metabolic, ah, sorry, met, I'm gonna say metabolic. I knew I was gonna say that. Respiratory alkalosis um, because I am, um, think of like an alcoholic who throws up stuff. <laughs> um, uh, what do you call it? I am, I am breathing out my acid. So alkalosis, I'm getting it all out. Um, if that helps you, if that doesn't just ignore me. <laughs> so yes. Um, but uh, effectively, um, uh, what do you call them? These patients will be at risk for respiratory alkalosis. Now with time, when they get tired and tuckered out and they're not breathing fast or um, eventually their um, body tires out, they can go into respiratory acidosis, but usually the prominent one they have is the alkalosis. So how do we know they're getting better or worse? Um, it all comes down, you know, to their respiratory status. So we would look for signs that they're oxygenating and I'm not working so hard. Um, their lung sounds are clear. Where signs that they're getting worse are going to be, you know, um, and there's what's, I mean, there's respiratory failure, but there's also what's known as status asthmaticus, um, where like they're in like almost a like fixed state in their asthma attack. And, you know, patients like this, I've uh, seen them down in the ER where, um, you know, I'm getting report from the ER and they're saying, hey, we gave 
20 albuterol treatments back to back and their lungs are like their um, airways are still constricted. And so, um, yeah, it, it's pretty um, crazy sometimes how resistant, um, like I said, like this is one of those things like they can walk, be walking around doing just fine, but then they come in touch with a trigger and that trigger can um, definitely set off a chain of events where it's really hard to um, catch up or get ahead. It's going to take some time. So we're going to, um, if it, they're getting worse, we're going to look for the opposite where like their oxygen stats are going down, their work of breathing is worse, they're complaining of worsening, shortness of breath and dyspnea. And probably the most ominous or worst sign that you would see in an asthma patient is what's known as a silent chest um, or any diminished or absent breath sounds. So, you know, we talked about sometimes where diminished is okay or expected. Like if I have a pleural effusion, I'm going to hear diminished because I'm listening over nothing. Like there's nothing there um, to hear. So um, what do you call it? Um, those are going to be diminished. If I have atelectasis, that's going to be diminished. That's okay. We're going to talk about with COPD, they can have diminished sounds too. Um, but for asthma, diminished is not good because it means that there's no air movement. Um, so um, with wheezing, like it was whole, like some people can listen and if they hear really bad, like <sighs> they might be like, oh my God, that's really bad. Their wheezing is, is getting worse. Maybe, maybe not. Wheezing though, at least, even though we maybe don't like wheezing, we don't want wheezing forever. Wheezing, at least you can hear that air is passing through in their lungs. Um, and so um, the patient is able to, to move enough air to make a sound. Um, uh, and so what you really want to worry about is when, if you hear diminished or absent sounds for, uh, for asthma, that means, cause remember this is an airway closure problem. Um, what do you call it? Um, where it's getting either so like that belt tight around the airways is closing in, or there's so much mucus that we're clogging internally. Um, so diminished or absent sounds is much more concerning than any type of wheezing. So if you have a, you know, a test question that's asking about um, how do you know asthma is getting better? It's usually nothing to do with the wheezing. If you have, they have clear lung sounds, great. Um, but diminished absent sounds, or like if it says like decreased wheezing, that's not a, necessarily a good thing because decreased wheezing could mean that um, that they are now have more diminished or ab absent sounds. And again, I'm not your professor. So if you don't go to my school, you know, ignore this, but because um, uh, your professors could look at this differently, um, but effectively we, like, we do want less wheezing. We want them to be clear though. We do not want them to be absent or um, decreased because um, again, decreased wheezing could mean um, closed airway or more blockage in that airway. So medical treatments, a lot of the mainstays, and this is um, something that um, I have to write a correction on for some of my previous lectures and stuff, but it looks like current uh, guidelines around asthma now say that, it, at least per this textbook, that um, now steroids are supposed to be the first uh, treatment, maybe. It's very confusing. In our textbook, currently it says, in some parts, it says that you're supposed to use steroids first and that the SABAs are no longer a first-line treatment. But in other places, it says inhaled steroids are not for acute attacks and that they take time. So it's it's rather confusing. So this is what I would say, is, is that, I mean, this is always up to a doctor. And if, if the book can't make up its mind and if there's mixed literature on this, you you know, we're not going to give you a question that's going to say, do you do the steroid first or the SABA first? Um, just know as a whole, your first meds are steroids and SABAs. Now, which one goes first? That's up to a physician, et cetera, or someone who's trained in respiratory therapy. Um, but when it comes down to it, someone who's up to date and every patient might be a little different, but just know the first meds as a whole, the first ones you want to go to are things that are going to decrease swelling and inflammation in the airway, like the steroids, and then also decrease um, or open up um, that airway like the SABAs. So these are usually the first two meds that are going to be used. Um, we may also use inhaled anticholinergics. I'll talk about those more with COPD, but they can relax the smooth muscle in my airway and also decrease some of those secretions. Um, long term, we need to use um, things like LABAs or long acting beta agonists. How these help is these help through um, starting to, uh, you know, kind of long, uh, more long-term instead of having to be rescued all the time, like I'm having an acute attack, I need treatment. I'm um, long acting beta agonists help me, uh, to not react so much or stay open. Uh, I don't know. No, it's not that they help me not react so much. Let me take that back. It's that they help to keep my airways more open to allow where I might not need to use my SABA 
so often. Um, and remember, this is all about reacting. So if I do want to stop reacting so much, then the medication I actually want to use is this oral, the LTRA is the leukotriene receptor antagonist. And how these help again is, is that they're used like we talked about for allergic rhinitis. And so for uh, with these, um, how they help is, is that they're going to stop your body from reacting to whatever it is that's reacting. It's not going to be perfect, but it definitely can decrease that reaction. And with that decrease in reaction, you're not going to have so many attacks. Because remember with asthma, it's all about preventing attacks. If they're not having attacks, they are out living their life and they're doing okay. Um, there are, uh, there is also what's called theophylin. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this. This is a very toxic med, so we don't use it very often, but it is possible you might see it on the NCLEX, so I always include it. Um, so remember, this is an obstruction oxygenation issue. So this patient will most likely need oxygen as well. Um, but we'll talk about it first. We have to open that airway. Um, so just as a reminder about some of these meds, we talked about these when we talked about anaphylaxis. Um, there's inhaled corticosteroids. These decrease inflammation. They suppress your overreaction um, to, um, uh, what do you call it, um, you know, whatever you're reacting to in, in an allergic sense because they express your immune system. So it stops you from reacting so much. Um, the one thing we do want to watch out for is thrush. And if you remember, we prevent this through um, good oral rinses, um, you know, keeping everything clean, making sure to rinse after, um, you know, your treatments and doing good oral care in general. And then also using a spacer can help to prevent thrush. Um, all of the inhaled steroids in an own or eyed. Whereas the SABAs, these work differently because they open your airway. Um, that's their primary thing is it's like a fight or flight where it opens your airway as if a bear is coming to attack you, it's going to defend you. Um, we want to use this in caution with people with cardiovascular problems because it can increase your heart rate and blood pressure significantly. Um, so side effects. So remember, like, you know, we want to use caution in those patients and we want to watch their heart rate and blood pressure closely. Um, but the side effects you might expect, you might want to tell patients is they might feel anxious and they could also have tremors. Um, all these medications end in OL or OLAW, like al albuterol. So then there's LABAs. Now LABAs effectively are just like the SABAs. Um, except that they work for long-term, like 12 hours. These are not for acute exacerbations. These are our maintenance meds. They have similar side effects and they all end in oral, um, like salmeterol and things like that. Um, and like I mentioned, there's also theophylin, um, which is in this class, the methylene, blah, blah, deans. <laughs> and uh, these, um, that, that's the professional way to say it, by the way, if you're ever a nurse, it's the, you know, just cover your mouth and say something really quick and patients will always go for it. And I'm just joking. If, um, if you don't know me, I am always full of crap. Um, and so needless to say, um, uh, as a whole, theophylline is not used very often. I've been in and around healthcare 17, 18 years, and I've maybe seen it used a handful of times. Um, it's only used if other things aren't working and we've tried everything and we're kind of at our last ditch effort. Um, it used to be used more often, but it's so toxic. You want to look for these signs of toxicity, like the GI symptoms, the neuro symptoms. Um, and it's not for an acute attack, but it can help if someone's really like everything we're doing, nothing's working and it can be given IV or PO. So like I was mentioning with asthma and oxygen, I'm going to need oxygen for this patient. This patient is usually low on oxygen. They're using up a lot of their supply. So there's a supply demand issue. Um, but um, just something to keep in mind is that I can throw oxygen at this patient all day long, but if they have a closed airway issue, an airway resistance issue, a um, narrow airway issue, I have to open it first. Now, I'm not saying you're going to say, well, I'm not even placing this oxygen on. It can't get in. Um, they're going to need the oxygen, but make sure you're also doing something thing to open that airway because no, I cannot force oxygen in um, if there, the airway is closed. Um, so we usually start with that. Um, make sure that we're doing, doing something to treat the actual problem versus just trying to throw a bunch of oxygen on them as their airway is slowly closing. So as the nurse, um, it's again, this is a disease that needs to be managed. Um, my goal is, is to prevent attacks, so I'm going to give them lots of teaching um, in order to help to prevent those attacks. I'm going to, and I'll talk about the teaching in the slides upcoming, 
I want them to avoid their triggers. They can keep a diary or other things if it helps um, to know um, what are the things that are going to, um, you know, uh, you know, where they have more attacks. Because sometimes some people may know what they're allergic to, some people don't. Um, if they can take their Sabbath before exercise, that's especially helpful. It can help, especially if they're going to be under stress or strain. Um, that Sabbath can make a big difference. Kind of like we take diphenhydramine before getting exposed to a trigger. Um, we want to support their respiratory status if the attacks occur. So the head of bed elevated, frequent respiratory assessments, increasing their fluid intake, two to three liters, um, and doing um, purslet breathing. So the frequent respiratory to look for changes. Because um, like I say here at the bottom, we, we need to get help early because um, they can have very, very serious hypoxia or lack of oxygenation um, that can lead to brain death and other things um, that I've seen um, when not caught early enough. So watching their respiratory assessments closely. Um, we want to increase their fluids because this is a thick mucus problem. Um, and so we want to get that mucus up and out, teach them that purse lip breathing because that prolonged exhalation is going to really be helpful with them. And that's where we tell them to purse their lips, kind of like they're going to give a kiss. And then they do a it helps to prolong that exhalation. Um, you could try it for fun in your spare time. Um, and then I want to teach them how to prevent attacks because again, if we don't have attacks, asthma, it can be very well managed. Even if they have attacks, it can be managed too, but we really want to avoid those attacks. Um, so we told them about knowing their triggers, avoiding them. Um, and so, so that means uh, AS, no uh, picking up cats and sniffing them to see if you're allergic. Hmm. Um, anyway, um, that's a message that's only to a specific person. So if you're not AS, don't worry about it. Uh, also, uh, doing uh, medication, giving medications to prevent asthma attacks, like the things that are going to help suppress um, the uh, over response to the allergen, like the LTRAs. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the patient's going to need two things. One is a peak flow meter and one is an asthma action plan. So we talked about the peak flow meter. This is something that can be used to help diagnose asthma, but it also is a maintenance um, device that they're going to have at home. Now, all this does is tell me how much resistance is in my airway. Um, but um, pretty much, I, uh, like I mentioned, what we do with these patients is we wait till they're in a period where they're, you know, their asthma is well controlled. Um, and then we check their peak flow and we try to get like, okay, this is the, when they're at their best, this is the, the amount of resistance that's in their airway. And then what they do is they create an asthma action plan based around that number um, to know when they need to take medications or seek help. Um, so the asthma action plan has three zones. There's a green zone, a yellow zone, and a red zone. Um, the green zone is where they're at 80% or greater of their personal best. So if they're, uh, let's say their personal best is like 400 or something like that. If they're at like 375, they're probably in the green zone. Um, it usually means that, that things are stable for now. And um, it's not that they need to do nothing. They should still keep taking their regular maintenance medications. If they're about to go exercise, they should still take their SABA. Whatever they're doing is working right now. They don't need to do anything extra, but they need to continue to do whatever is already prescribed for them. Um, we get down to the yellow zone. This is 50 to 80%. So if it was that 400, if I was down to like 200, um, or I would see if it's maybe about like 250, um, I'm, you know, in that 50 to 80% of my personal best. At this point, I need to probably take a rescue med. I'm, sh I'm showing signs of resistance um, uh, in my airway. Um, if there's no improvement in my peak flow after, I would call my HCP or start to look at getting some help. Um, then the red zone, this is below 50%. So this is if I was a 400 and then I'm down to 150. Um, I need to seek help now, take my rescue medications, and then um, call my healthcare provider or more likely go to the emergency department. And this is just an example of a um, asthma action plan. So you can see it has the medicines when you're doing well, take your maintenance meds. Um, and then when you're, if your asthma is getting worse here, take this one how much to take, take this, you know, so it's telling you what to do, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, and how long to wait. And it even tells you the symptoms. Because again, this is all about making sure we don't get to the point where we, um, the airway completely closes. It's not like anaphylaxis where it closes like that, um, but it can come on up pretty quickly. So we definitely want to uh, watch closely.
So um, I have this summing up. It's great after you listen to a lecture like this. It's a great thing. What you could do after this is, um, you know, the video stops and then try to talk out loud and sum up asthma for yourself or teach someone else. Um, it's and without your notes or anything, just what comes to mind. How would you sum it up? How would you explain it? If your mom, dad, sister, brother, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, child, whatever asked you and they don't have any medical experience, what is asthma? What would you tell them? How would you sum it up? Well, how would you explain it to them? Or if you had a family member or a loved one who had asthma and says, what do you know about it? What would you teach them? Um, so try to sum it up and bring it all together in your own words. It's a great way to study. Anyway, see you for the next one.